All right. Am I, am, I, am I good now? All right. All right. Amen. Well, okay. You know, one of the great gospel songs tells us take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. The trouble with a lot of us folks, though, is that we take our burdens to the Lord, we lay them down before him, and then we take them back with us. You're supposed to leave them there. That's what the song right, right. Take them to the Lord, leave them there. But, you know, we get comfortable carrying those burdens. If for some of us, our identity is in those burdens. Our vision is connected to those burdens, and so we don't want to let them go. Today, I want to talk to you about developing and maintaining a kingdom perspective. Somebody say that with me, a kingdom perspective. Bow your heads with me and pray. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, see, mark, learn, and take them to heart. By the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Mark 7, 24. I know it wasn't in your reading today, but it was actually kind of part of it. You know, if you manage to get the crumbs that fall from the table, you get uh, 24 through 30. I'm a, Share that too, all right? Plus, it, it kind of fits with where I'm going today. Just ride with me, all right? But uh, from there he arose, went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he could not be hidden. How many of you all know that even Jesus sometimes needs to get away? You know, I, 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 I have to travel a lot being a missionary. I have to travel a lot because I have to build a network because I want to stay here in Gary. And as wonderful as Indiana is, Indiana does not have a money tree growing in Fort Wayne. You know, so I have to travel and get some other folk to come and help y'all help me. And I, and I don't mind Southwest Airlines because they got that getaway thing. But I will say this though, I think all those Southwest pilots were former Navy pilots. I'm going to tell you why. The Air Force pilots, they have this long runway, and they take off, and they do it nice and smooth, you know. Those Navy pilots, they got this little bitty piece of runway. It's about yay big. And they either get up or they fall down. And so they, 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 they hit that catapult, and off they go, and they almost go straight up. And then when it's time to come down, it's the same thing. It's still a little bitty piece of runway. And so when they come down, they just slam that airplane down. And that's what flying on Southwest feels like. I think I ought to get me some pilot's wings by now. Something. But they said Jesus needed to get away. And in this case, he leaves Jewish territory. He goes up north into what's now Lebanon area, Tyre and Sidon. And he goes into a house he doesn't want to be known. Now, I know why he didn't want to be known. I know this because I know what he does normally. We're talking about the same guy who, who early in his ministry goes into the synagogue in his hometown, grabs a scroll, reads it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Rolls it up and says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the same guy that goes up on a hill so everybody can see him. And spends three chapters in Matthew's gospel telling them that, well, I know you heard that it was supposed to be this way, but let me tell you something. That guy all of a sudden goes into a house and doesn't want to be known. There's only one reason why a guy like that goes somewhere and doesn't want to be known. He needs to get away. He's been working hard and he needs some downtime, some me time. How many of y'all need some me time? Every now and again. I notice more of the wives raise their hands. Uh-huh. 
fellas. I don't know what y'all doing now. I'm just saying. I just noticed that. Let me get back to the text, though, because then I'd be preaching another sermon, and I don't want y'all to be like that little boy in Paul's book actually fell out the window. Not today. Immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She answered him, yes, Lord. You're right. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. He said to her, well, for this statement, you go your way. The demons left your daughter. She went home. Sure enough, she found the child lying in the bed. The demon gone. The woman, remember now, she's a Syrophoenician by birth. She's a Gentile. But she understood the kingdom respect. He had no claim on Christ, but one, claim of faith. She knew who Jesus was. She knew what Jesus could do. And more importantly, she knew what moved Jesus. She knew that uh, her being a Gentile didn't give her any right to say, look, uh, there, was, there was a covenant made, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm a child of the covenant. You owe me. She knew that wasn't going anywhere. She knew she's a woman. She ain't got no influence. She's got no authority. She knew that wasn't going to work. But she knew that the God of all grace could not stand and see one of his children asking for mercy and grace to help in a time of need and turn away. And so even as Jesus gives his first reaction, well, you know, not right for me to, no, no disrespect now, but uh, the kids' food belongs to the kids, not to the little dogs. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay, Lord. I understand that. But we can still lick up the crumbs. Now, I was studying this over at the Lydia house the other day, and one of the women said to me, you know, she was ticked off, Pastor. I said, what do you mean? And there's nothing that the text says she was ticked off. He said, Pastor, he called her a little dog. I said, well, okay. He said, but, he said, but you know why nothing happened right then? I said, no, tell me why. And this, this theologian, this, this future missionary said to me, he said, because she knew what she needed, what she needed was more important than how she felt. What she needed from the Lord meant more to her than her personal feelings about the matter. So even though she had no right to claim, even though in the eyes of the Jews she might have been as a little dog, even though all that might be the case, and even though Jesus says it himself, nevertheless, somebody say to me, nevertheless, oh, I got a church in here today. I might preach this. Nevertheless, she knew what her daughter needed. And she knew that Jesus was able. And she knew that she could just endure a little affliction to get what she wanted from the Lord. Are you ready to endure a little bit? See, the Bible says that tribulation produces patience. Patience develops character. Character brings forth hope. But we live in a generation where if you can't get it in 60 seconds or less, they don't want it. They want the kingdom without the tribulation. They want the blessing without the prayer. They want the honor and the anointing without any go through. Now, some of you church mothers and church elders, y'all know it's not that way. But these young folks, they're just accustomed. You know, they, they hit the button and it comes on. They do the, t the computer thing, the information. So they're used to that. That's why we need older folks in church. I know it don't look like it the way the, you know the way they do those those uh programs to draw people in. It seems like everybody on the promotion is young and, and cute and everything. But we need we need some gray hair and some some ball head in the congregation. Remind y'all young people that sometimes you gotta go through to get to. I ain't gonna make you say that one, because that might be too much, right? But just just put that in your pocket for a little while. 
Let me come to our first reading, Isaiah 35. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong. Fear not. Your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Then the ears of the deaf be unstopped. See, the Syrophoenician woman, she understood what Jesus could do. She believed it wasn't in his nature to send her away empty. How do you see God's promises? Let me shift one more time to James. I know our, our beloved apostle, Dr. Luther, didn't think much of James' epistle, or an epistle of straw. But I think it's going to work for us today. Follow with me. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory. For if a man wears a gold ring, I don't think he's talking about a wedding ring. You can get those pretty cheap. The men's ring, not the women's ring. <laughs> I think this might have cost me about 30, 40 bucks. My wife's ring, not even close to that. Not stupid. <laughs> If a man wears a gold ring and fine clothing, he comes in your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place. You say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, y'all heard the brother read that earlier. I imagine for a lot of you all, you would think, oh, yeah, that's talking about, you know, not being prejudiced and you know, not, you know, mistreating people because they're poor and things like that. But there's a deeper point. There's a point that even good congregations need to consider. Now, this is a nice, beautiful, well lit sanctuary. Man, y'all got all kind of good stuff here. Now, what do you need in order to do the work of ministry? I mean, what, come on, come on. Let me help me out here. What, what, what is the one thing you need in order to do the work of ministry here at Trinity Memorial? Oh, you cheated. Now, see, I was going to have a little fun with y'all, but well, there you go. That's right. He's right, though. Fundraising. Because without money, bills don't get paid. Without money, the secretary, she can't work for the church. Well, she can maybe, you know, put in one day a week. You know, Saturday afternoon after she's done everything else. But if you want her there Monday through Friday, you got to pay that woman. Amen. Amen. Secretary going, yes, Lord. Without money, the pastor can't be fully committed to serving the congregation that called him. I know some folk like my daddy used to say, look at that man over there. He worked two hours. He thinks he should get paid like I do working 40 hours. My daddy passed away before I went into seminary. But I guarantee you, if he was still around, me and I would have had a conversation about those words. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being by vocation. I'm not saying, but you understand every time you have to punch a clock, the time that you punch that clock belongs to the person for whom you punch it. And if I'm being by vocational and I'm at Tracking Van Til 20 hours a week. Don't call me during that 20 hours talking about grandma in the hospital. I can't help you. Tracking Van Til ain't gonna care about that. If I'm working at Walmart, you know, greeting y'all and, and displaying the love of Christ, you know. God bless you. Thanks for coming to Walmart. You know that whole time I'm at Walmart, I can't be praying for you right then. I can't be Pastor Dale while I'm Wally Walmart. I know some people, they think, well, you know, y'all ought to be there working because all y'all do is, no, that ain't all we do. That's not all we do. Some of y'all know the more that we do. If you don't know about it yet, keep living. You'll find out. But, I mean, the bottom line is, if y'all stop giving, this stops functioning. God ain't planted no money trees in the backyard, has he? No, he ain't. So then when a person with resources comes to visit, don't you get excited? Come on, now, if, if, if Denzel Washington walked down that aisle, I don't care if you had never seen damn one of his movies. Denzel come rolling up in here with his entourage, you'd be like, ooh, ooh that. Man, he dressing mighty nice there. And he took a seat right up there. 
came time for the offering, everybody would be leaning over. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, hey, that, that's how it is because money makes the world go round. That's what everybody says. But when somebody who you can tell is struggling comes through those doors, and you're glad they came because you want everybody to go to heaven, don't you? Amen, except that person that ticked you off and stole your parking spot. Other than that person, you want everybody to go to heaven. But from the world's perspective, those who have needs are a liability. Those who have resources are an asset. And you can't run a business or a church with an account that's full of expenses and got no revenue. Ain't that right? All right. I know it's not, it's not tithe Sunday, so I'm not going to stand there too long. <laughs> but it's just the natural inclination to look at people in terms of what they bring to the table. Mamas will tell their daughters, I know he's cute. But baby girl, what does he bring to the table? I know he got a smooth talking line, but what can he do for you? You can do bad all by yourself. Well, mamas don't just tell daughters that. You know, church boards, they tell pastors that too. I know you want to go evangelize the world and you want to bring all the homeless in here, but the homeless don't pay the bills, pastor. Now, now y'all here at, at Penny Memorial, I know that's not y'all. So that, that's going to the church down the street, all right? Get mad at that. He didn't tell me nothing about that, all right? All right. But if, hypothetically speaking, you see that person come in and they, you know, they need some stuff and you say to them, oh, go in peace. God bless you. We love you. And you don't give them nothing. This isn't just about being prejudiced or anything like that. This is about the simple fact we understand naturally where things come from. We know how you get stuff, and there are things in a kingdom perspective that are counterintuitive because we look at a person and we gauge them, we measure them, and sometimes we think they are lacking. Many, many techers parts them. We think that because they're driving a hoopty, but God has a plan for that person and you, and he puts you all together for a reason. He might have put you all together because although that person can't be the direct resource for you, that person will lead you to another person. Because as you begin to minister to that person, it causes another person that has a heart for that ministry to want to come alongside of you. Amen? Don't nobody want to come and pour into something that's already full. Everybody likes to think they did something that helped get it full. You don't need to come in here when it's filled to the rim, do you? You can go any place else for that, but if you got a gift you want to share, you want to go someplace where they'll appreciate that gift. I know, you know, that's all talking all deep and faith and everything, poor, rich in faith. So the treasurer's going to, you, you go throw that at the treasurer, you know, the poor, rich in faith, and he's going to throw back King Solomon. That is made for laughter now. Wine glad is life, and money answers everything now, Pastor. Yeah, well. What can we say to this situation? What, what can we say about the need for resources? Well, if God be for us, we need him to send us some more rich folk. That, that we got. You know, God knows what we would do if the wealth of the wicked was laid up for the righteous here at Trinity Memorial, right? He knows you'd be faithful if he blessed you with finances, right? You would be. I see the evidence all around me. But see, James don't play fair telling you that the poor are the heirs of the kingdom. He's pounding you with the law instead of giving you the gospel. You know, that epistle of straw is kind of hurtful, wouldn't you say? That's a really strong straw he got up in there. Feel more like an epistle of, uh, of wood, oak. Man, that's what, my, that's what my daddy used to use on me, oak. He didn't use no straw. We need God to help us in those times when the kingdom perspective and our earthly perspectives don't match up. When God's word of promise seems out of sync with our situation, we need God to help us out. So let me get back to this gospel text here. I told you Jesus wanted some me time. So he goes all the way up to Tyre. And then the woman comes along. Then he comes all the way back down to Galilee, makes a detour into the Decapolis. But he's still in Gentile territory. He's still trying to, some me time. Do 
job. I don't think he was just trying to avoid the Pharisee. Y'all remember the story about the woman with the issue of blood? Y'all heard about that one in Sunday school? All right. Well, in Mark's reading of it, he says that she heard the reports about Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd, touched his garment. She said, even if I touch his garment, I'll be made well. Of course, she was right. Everything got healed. And then Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, turned in the crowd and said, who touched my garment? Not perceiving in himself that somebody had touched him, but perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him. Something came out of Jesus. He felt the essence of it leaving him. See, ministry takes something out of you. When I finish preaching, lead the saints in worship, I can't just go out and run around for a while. I'm, I got to sit down for a minute. Is that right, Pastor? You got you got to take a rest when you finish working and serving the saints of God. Some some folk think this is easy work. Like we just stand here. And the word just, you know, drops down in our brain, just pops out of our mouth. Y'all been watching too much TV here. It don't work like that. Every time you look around, Jesus was spending the night in prayer. Why y'all think that was? He had to get refreshed because some of these demons and folk be coddling. It takes all the prayer and fasting we can muster to keep them demons in check. Y'all don't know we be praying for y'all. We pray for y'all when y'all forget to pray for y'all. That takes a lot out of a brother. And then these folks from the Decapolis, they bring this death mute to Jesus and beg him to heal their friend. Now what's Jesus supposed to do? Can Jesus say, look y'all, I'm just here, get a little R&R. &R. I, I don't have no agreement with y'all and y'all not in the covenant. Y'all need to go and find somebody. Go talk to one of your doctors or something, but just leave me alone. No, do not disturb. You can't do that. Oh, so, verse 33 takes him aside. Y'all know, put his fingers in his ear. He sighs. He sighs. Actually, the word that, that, that translated is called sighs, it, it also generally is translated as groan. And one time in James, it's translated grumble. Put it this way. It's not a pleasant side. It's not that side that you go when you go to the car lot and you see the car you want and it just happens to be the mid-year closing sale and you get it for half off. It's not that side. It's not the side that comes about in May or June when, when you just needed it. The IRS sends you back the money that belongs to you. They done borrowed for you. It's not that side. It's more like the side it comes when somebody comes knocking on your door, you already tired out, and they tell you that their lawnmower don't work. And they already got one thing from the city that you cut their grass for them. It's the side when your mother-in-law calls you up at 10 o'clock at night saying a TV stopped working. And it's just a blue screen. Could you come over and see why her TV's broke? You already know that the TV isn't broke. She just hit the button that moved it from. Some of y'all got that phone gone, huh? <laughs> yes, indeed. That's why Jesus groans. Because <laughs> now he still got to do some work. He didn't come out there to work. But you need to know something, saints. You need to know that the God whom you worship is the God who might groan, but he gonna press on. The God who you call on his name in the midnight hour, he's the God who went to the wall for you. Hebrews 12, three and four says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you might not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Amen? Ain't none of y'all sitting on a cross because of your sin. Jesus did that for you. You struggle against sin. I hope y'all struggling against sin. I know pastor preaches law and gospel, so you better be struggling against sin. But you do. You fight against fear and doubt. 
But Jesus is the one that went to the cross. Jesus hung, bled, and died. You still here living. Jesus said, be open, and that man could hear. And that same Jesus said, it is finished. So that now you can go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen? So Jesus spoke the word. And if you receive it, embrace it, how do we say it in the prayer? And ever hold fast to it, you can walk in faith. You can walk in that kingdom perspective because Jesus did all the work. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone that asks you the reason for the hope that lies within you. But do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. You've got a good conscience now. Ain't that what the word said? But how did it, how'd you get it? Well, you didn't get it from your resisting under bloodshed. We already covered that when you're not up there on the cross. Peter goes on, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. That's where you got your good conscience. See that little font right there? That little font with that water that some of your, your frenemies in church will say, well, how can water do all that? When you tell them, I know I'm saved because I'm baptized in Christ. I know I'm saved because I'm united with Christ in his death. I don't need a sign or a wonder to know that I'm saved. I know that God is faithful. How many of y'all know that today? Is God faithful? Amen, somebody. When you went over to that font and pastor poured that water on your forehead and he said those words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you might not have been able to articulate what happened. Maybe you were a baby, but let me tell you something, folks. Babies ain't as dumb as you think. You see that one right there? She knows. She knows who she can go to to get what she wants. She knows if she tags along with me, sooner or later, I'm going to stop somewhere nice. So I can't even go take out the trash without her tagging along. Them babies be knowing. You might not understand what they're saying when you pour that water on their head, but have you ever noticed that they always say something? They just speaking in tongues, y'all. They just giving God the glory for what he's done because they experience in themselves faith coming in with that water. See, the problem for some of our frenemies out there in the body of Christ is they don't think that water does anything. So they keep looking for something else. When God put all he needed to put in that water, God put all the anointing he needed to put in that water. God put all the promise he needed to put in that water. God put all the keys of the kingdom in that water. And when that water touches you, you are brought into relationship with God. You don't have to prove your relationship. All you have to remember your baptism. Can you say that with me today? Remember my baptism. Keep my eyes on Jesus. Because he's the one. Yes, indeed. He's the one. See, baptism. God gave you that good conscience from there, that water that gave you faith so you can come boldly to the throne of grace. That's why God planted this church here in Maryville. That's why God planted St. John in Tolleston. That's why God planted Good Shepherd in Midtown and in every other place where there's a confessional, evangelical witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why God didn't just leave it in the hands of enthusiasts. That's why God didn't just leave it in the hands of legalists. He gave us this gift, and we're supposed to take this gift and run with it. I know you're tired, but it's still time to work. But the one whom you work with, the one who works in you, that's the one for in whom dwells all the fullness of deity bodily. And you've been filled in him. You've been made complete in him. You've been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hand. You've been made complete through faith in the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, if that don't stir up the joy that the Holy Spirit put inside of you, come on up here so I can lay some hands on you. 
I don't know what to say because I, I look, I know money is good. I know money is good. I know healing is good. I know housing and land is good. But there's nothing that tops Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can't take that money with you when you go six feet down. You can't take those, well, you can take one of those nice outfits with you, but you won't know about it. But you won't need that nice outfit when you stand up on the resurrection morning. You won't need that nice car that you've been driving when you step up into heaven. You're not going to need those things, but you are going to need Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? And Christ really is for you. Christ did everything you need to get you to that moment, to that moment when you're standing in the presence of the Lord, when you're able to say, hallelujah, Jesus, when you're able to worship him in beauty, in the spirit of holiness, when all the things that you've waited for are now before you, surrounding you, and you experience that peace that passes all understanding because Christ is really for you. Tell your neighbor that Christ is. For you. Y'all got that inside your spirit? All right, I'm done then. <laughs> so let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen.